basis uh, in this state over just the last seven days. The economic consequences uh, are profound. And I want to speak to those issues today, not only from the individual's perspective as it relates to unemployment insurance claims, the issue of jobs, but also the impact uh, on Main Street, the impact on small businesses. 49% of state employees, uh, or rather 49% of all private sector employees in the state of California are employed by small businesses, people that make a go of it, put everything on the line, take risks uh, in ways large and small. When we think about small businesses, it's not someone with hundreds of employees. In many cases, uh, it's not someone with any employees, self-employed individuals, independent contractors, businesses that have one or two part-time employees. And so often we take them for granted, even in the best of times. Right now, uh, they have been devastated. Uh, and I want to speak specifically about what the state of California is proposing to do for small businesses. And I also want to highlight what the federal government has done to help small businesses, because we will not be the beneficiary of that help unless we are aware of what it is exactly uh, that is being provided and how we can access those supports. So let me begin with what the state is now announcing and advancing as it relates to supporting small businesses. Uh, every small business man or woman knows exactly uh, what I'm referencing when it comes to the issue of sales tax. We collect your sales tax as a small business. We send it to the state, distributed back down to the cities and counties. Uh, the customer pays the sales tax. We hold that into an account. Uh, every quarter, we fill out forms, small business men and women, and I'm a former small business men and, uh, man, so I, I know a thing or two about this. Uh, and we send that money uh, to the state. Uh, what we are calling for today uh, is a one-year reprieve for small businesses where no fines, no penalties will be attached, where they can take upwards of $50,000 as a loan and not have to pay the state those sales tax receipts for 12 months. In essence, it is a bridge loan. The money that you've already collected, you will not have to pay the state for 12 months. No penalties, no interest, de facto a loan. I had previously signed an executive order extending uh, for a uh, number of months through July 31st the need to even file your sales tax. This extends beyond that. Uh, as a reprieve uh, so that upwards of $50,000 uh, can be used as a bridge loan over the course of the next 12 months. And I call it a bridge loan in this context because we need to be able to get the federal dollars into the state of California, which means we need to get people to apply for these federal supports that were recently announced, both in the previous stimulus and then the more recent stimulus that just passed the $2.2 trillion. There are two programs in particular I want to highlight, and they're incredibly important for small businessmen and women to take advantage of. Number one was the disaster injury uh, disaster account. It's the small business loan related uh, to injury related to the economic consequences of COVID-19. You can get a $10,000 loan up front as your application is being processed you're presumed eligible for the dollars in that loan account. That loan provides upwards of $2 million for small businesses, uh, payback over 30-year period, uh, and interest rates uh, of 3.75%, uh, and for nonprofits in that category, 2.75%. We want to make sure people are taking advantage of that economic injury disaster loan program. We have information on our covid19.ca.gov website, covid19.ca.gov website that will link you to the SBA, link you uh, to the services and supports so that you can take advantage of that program. The other even more significant program was just recently passed in the CARES Act. Again, that's the $2.2 trillion act. This provides businesses up to $10 million loans. If you continue to pay your employees, you have to provide 75% of all of that loan benefit to your employees, to payroll. This can be done through your bank, 
through traditional institutions, not just through the SBA. This is the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP program uh, that is finally getting some attention. This is a profoundly significant program that has $349 billion of federal supports attached to it. This program starts tomorrow, and that's why it's incredibly important people start filling out the application, filling out the form to make sure that they are aware of their eligibility. And this is one of those things a lot of people are going to be rushing uh, to get the benefit of this program. Again, April 3rd is the first day to start drawing down those applications. So work with your bank, work with your lender, and if you commit to keeping your employees, even if you have no business, even if your business is closed, but you pay your employees, this is a grant program, not a loan program, where you are reimbursed for the costs. Again, the cap is $10 million, not insignificant. Uh, but there is a modest, well, modest is relative, but a 0.5% fee attached to it, interest rates fixed at 0.5%. Above and beyond that, you have the capacity to substantially get all of that loan completely uh, paid off by the federal government as a grant on the other side. Uh, it's all may sound very complicated. In many respects, it is. We just want to make it easier for folks. And again, go to our website, that covid19.ca.gov website, and we've got a link right there, uh, and we'll link all the information to folks so they can take advantage of these programs. The reality, though, is not everyone can take advantage of these programs. While the SBA has debt uh, forgiveness programs, and they have other programs uh, that one can avail themselves to. Not everybody uh, has the capacity to get an SBA loan. And as a consequence of that, uh, we're announcing today the state of California is putting $50 million into our iBank, our infrastructure bank, uh, to create micro lending opportunities for people that otherwise would not be eligible uh, for SBA relief, the Paycheck Protection Act, and these other uh, disaster, emergency injury disaster programs. And so it's an additional contribution for the state uh, to address those that may otherwise fall through the crack. So that's, that's an overall sense of what we're trying to do to highlight those federal supports advance some state relief through sales tax, up to $50,000 for a year with no interest, no penalties, and then provide micro-lending opportunities uh, through our iBank in the state of California. And we're encouraging businesses, large and small, again, uh, up to hundreds and hundreds of employees that are eligible uh, for the status uh, of these benefits to do just that and get prepared because tomorrow, again, on that Paycheck Protection Program, uh, those applications will start uh, being processed. And so let's get ahead of the queue uh, and let's make sure if you know someone is a small business person, make them aware of this. And if you are a small business person, uh, let's make sure you get this paperwork done and get those applications in as quickly as possible. Something else we're announcing today, I'm very proud of. I, I met with a a small group of people in Fresno, California, uh, about a year ago, organization called Bitwise. Remarkable uh, economic story uh, in Fresno and in the Central Valley, one that's not often highlighted uh, in the news. It's not just an agricultural community. It's a vibrant community with remarkable human capital, young people, uh, people young at heart, uh, doing incredible things, a good entrepreneurial spirit, uh, and a technical uh, uh, expertise uh, that is very present uh, in the Central Valley. And Bitwise is the center of this. Bitwise has partnered with LinkedIn and Salesforce to create a new site called onwardca.org, onwardca.org. And that's about getting us back up on our feet. Uh, not just small businesses, now people that have been laid off that need a job. Uh, Bitwise has already created uh, a remarkable website to match uh, open jobs to individuals and their particular skill set. They actually prompt 37 questions to specify where you are geographically, what your exact skill set is, what your wage preference uh, may look at, uh, look like, and then they match you with open job listings throughout the state of California. Already 70,000 open jobs are now listed on their site. We'll probably have 100 
plus thousand just in the next number of days. They prioritized four areas that disproportionately now are hiring remarkably at this moment. Not surprisingly though, healthcare being one of those four areas. Agriculture is looking for workforce. Uh, logistics broadly defined, be that transportation, warehousing, and the like, the logistics sector is in need of support. And of course, grocers. 70 plus thousand open jobs today in the state of California. Go to the Bitwise uh, uh, news site, this onwardca.org site, uh, and fill out those applications and see if we can match you with the job just down the road uh, and make sure uh, we get you off unemployment insurance. Or if you haven't gone on, make sure you don't have to go on uh, so that we can get you uh, into the workforce at this time. So I want to again thank our partners uh, in that uh, process and putting together this aggregated uh, job listing website. We also are very pleased about the work that is being done, the heroic work by some estimates. I mentioned one March 12th. Uh, not surprising, uh, that's unprecedented and it's overwhelming the call volume uh, at our uh, department we refer to as EDD. That's, the, uh, that's our state department that's responsible for processing applications for unemployment insurance. Uh, they had a 21-day turnaround on those unemployment checks uh, in the good days. Uh, we are struggling to keep up with that. We're still confident we can do that. Uh, we have reorganized our staffing, uh, 200 additional folks to deal with the surge of demand. We have 800 other folks uh, that are now uh, ready to increase uh, that capacity uh, beyond even the surge of supports to make sure we get these checks out to you as quickly as possible. I'll remind folks, checks are from the low of $40 uh, to as high as $450 a week for unemployment insurance. And in addition to that, people are eligible for at least the next four months for an additional $600 on top of the $40 to $450 a week because of the federal stimulus. And so those that may not have availed themselves to the unemployment insurance, uh, please do so. Uh, again, easiest site is the covid19.ca.gov site, uh, but EDD will process these, uh, and we are doing everything we can to make sure we do so in a timely manner, uh, because we recognize people are feeling deep anxiety uh, about just you know, paying for basic necessities and food and rent and the like and childcare for so many, uh, et cetera. So that's it in broad strokes where uh, we're leaning in to this economic moment. I should just preview, I've got an economic development team focusing on how we can get this state back on its feet sooner than later and what that looks like from an economic stimulus perspective. Some of the best and the brightest from across the country now advising the state of California, our Department of Finance, our Go Biz, which is our economic development team and advising us uh, which sectors that we should focus on and looking at our regulatory system and looking at ways we can uh, stimulate uh, real growth in real time when we turn the corner uh, on this virus. And so I want folks to know that we're taking this very, very seriously, but we have to deal with the immediate. And that's helping small businesses, and that's certainly helping individuals uh, that are out of work with these unemployment insurance claims. I want to just also make a few additional points and of course open up as we do uh, to any questions that we may have uh, to make uh, this point. Uh, a few, it was just a few days ago that I announced 25,000 people filled out applications, uh, phlebotomists and EMTs, paramedics, nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, doctors, et cetera, uh, to help support uh, their loved ones, their community, the state, and our healthcare delivery system by saying, you know what, I may have just retired, uh, but I'm happy to go back to work uh, as part of this health core site we put up. Today, we have over 70,000 applications. It's just extraordinary. <laughs> like the most difficult part for us is gonna be triaging all of these applications, but it just gives you a, a sense of this civic moment and how people are doing this extraordinary amount to try to participate in meeting it head on. And so I just wanna 
compliment all of those uh, of you that, uh, that uh, told folks about this website and may have filled out the application and know that we're going to do our best to get back to you in real time. And like that Bitwise site, we're going to try to match you up geographically and based on your expertise and work through uh, some details and, and just know uh, that uh, we are going to respond as quickly as we can. Uh, and in terms of response, let me just continue to make this point. I really want to thank all of you for practicing, not just sitting there promoting or preaching what we could or should do, pointing fingers. It's the individual acts of tens of millions of Californians that allow me to say the following. Uh, the numbers in the state of California are growing. The number of positives certainly are growing. And tragically, yes, the number of deaths, 203, uh, have grown. Uh, but the ICU numbers and the hospitalization numbers, while they're growing, are not growing as significantly as you're seeing in other parts of the country. We're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. And we showed folks what we mean by that when we showed you our modeling um, yesterday. The reality is that we are buying time. For every individual that's in the ICU, my heart goes out to them. It's 100, or excuse me, 816 individuals are currently in the ICU, represented a 5.4% increase uh, from yesterday. 1,922 people are in our hospital uh, uh, system with COVID-19 that are positively identified. Those are big numbers, but well within our modeling and well within our capacity uh, to serve and meet this moment. Uh, but again, it's the physical distancing that people are doing. It's taking this moment seriously that is allowing me to make that statement that we have the capacity currently to meet the moment. We still need to do more on personal protective gear, the N95 masks, and I could tell you, we can write a book about all the stories of how that process is unfolding in real time, and I know a lot of attention has been placed on that, uh, and much of what you're hearing is true in terms of it being the wild, wild west out there in terms of procuring those masks, the shields, the glove sets, uh, and the like. Uh, but currently in California, at least as of this morning, we've already distributed 35.9 million N95 masks. And while we've gotten 1,089,000 uh, from the national stockpile, and apparently we're going to get another 176,000 masks, we were just uh, told about that uh, this morning, uh, we recognize uh, we have to do more as a state. And so for the caregivers out there and for our grocers and police and fire, people on the front lines, broadly defined, uh, we recognize our obligation to you uh, to continue to find this personal protective gear and, and to do more to source not just N95 masks, but surgical masks uh, and the gowns and the coveralls that all of you do deserve. Uh, so our hospital system was slack, not just surge. Every day we're bringing on more beds, every day we're building capacity, and every day I continue to be mesmerized by the incredible leadership within our hospital system, our assisted living facilities, our skilled nursing homes, uh, where they are anticipating the need to do more and better, and providing more points of access uh, and more space as they reconstitute, repurpose existing space in order uh, to prepare uh, for our peak in the next number of weeks. Every hour, every day, we must take advantage of keeping this curve in a modest trajectory so we don't experience what other parts of our country, for that matter, other parts of the globe have. And every day, none of us will regret doing our part uh, to do more to bend that curve. Uh, final uh, point I want to make is we continue uh, to appreciate uh, and completely embrace the civic spirit that defines this moment even beyond just the health core site. I want to thank all the countless volunteers through our Cal Volunteers program that have gone to their site to contribute their time and energy at our food banks. Over 2 million uh, meals have been delivered just in the last few weeks just at our food banks, unprecedented surge of need. To all the folks that reached out a few days ago when we asked you to make five phone calls to connect with your neighbors and seniors and actually did so, thank you. Uh, that's an extraordinary and heroic effort. And we're seeing that on social media in terms of the partnership with Nextdoor. We're seeing that uh, in terms of the work that's being done with the Heart Association, the Alzheimer's uh, Association, and others, AARP, that are helping amplify uh, that 
sense of community, the commonwealth uh, all throughout the state of California. And I just, I can't impress upon you. Let's keep doing more of that. Let's stick together uh, and let's, uh, let's be defined by our capacity to, to, uh, to seize this moment as so many of you are seizing every single day to do the right thing, including making sure uh, that we are protecting our most vulnerable Californians, our seniors and our homeless. So that's broad strokes, the update for today, of course, here to answer any questions uh, that anybody may have. Carla Marinucci, Politico. Uh, yes, Governor, thank you very much. Um, uh, two, uh, this two-part question. Uh, Governor Cuomo in New York made the move to cancel construction sites in his state, and uh, this week the Bay Area health officers uh, appeared to do the same uh, when they issued new stay-at-home restrictions that prohibit most construction. Um, there looks to be a patchwork in California. The mayor of LA is taking a different take. Uh, if you're, if you're, if the uh, building sites are safe and the construction industry says they're enforcing and adhering to some very strict uh, uh, guidelines, are you comfortable allowing construction to continue in California uh, rather than uh, doing what they did in New York and Boston? Yeah, they uh, the, the other question I just have really quickly is: April 10th is coming with the second half of property taxes due. Is there any? suggestion that people can defer or waive those payments. Uh, so anyway, those are the two questions. Thank you. Thanks. So the conditions in New York are very different than the conditions in the state of California. We've been working very closely with the building construction trades, uh, specifically uh, long conversations with Robbie Hunter, their leader. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge and applaud them for their strict workforce efforts and making sure that their own members are protected and make sure their members are protecting their community and those that they serve. Uh, we put out guidelines a few weeks ago that we think are appropriate as baseline guidelines as it relates to construction in the state of California. I'm well aware of what the Bay Area did and they have a legal right, the health directors locally, to go even further. But the answer to your question is we're not in New York and we're going to do everything we can to bend our curve. We're not naive about uh, the magnitude of our challenge ahead of us. Uh, all of this is subject to change, but currently I'm satisfied with those state directives. Uh, as it relates uh, to, and now I've, almost, I've once again forgotten the, the second question. Carla, I'll go back uh, and answer that offline. John Myers, Los Angeles Times. Uh, Governor, thank you. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yeah, John, you may just need yep, to ask me one question. I seemingly have a capacity only for one. Uh, but you guys can circle back. I know you, you have a lot to, to ask, and I want to be able to okay. be as responsive as possible. I want to specifically ask you about the issue of people wearing masks in public, because some of this came up yesterday, but I think there's still a little bit of confusion out there. Your guidance pretty much leaves it up to people doing whatever they think is best, it seems like, from what we've seen. And that's not exactly what we've seen in Riverside, where they're being much more specific, and even L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti, who was much more specific last night. So are you not comfortable with issuing a little bit more um, strong guidance on this because it's not the same everywhere in the state? Do you think those locals are doing the right thing and people should just listen to that? And what is the message about wearing a mask, from well, your words? We were very clear in our message, no ambiguity, absolute clarity, first state to put out guidance. Uh, saying that the masks are additive, not a substitute. I'll repeat that. Uh, masks are not a substitute for physical distancing. That's crystal clear. It's an incredibly important message uh, to express. It's a very consistent message with Mayor Garcetti, and I think the message that was sent in Riverside as well. So there's continuity and clarity in terms of that message. Uh, here's an additional point I want to make. Uh, we believe and we put out guidelines that if individuals uh, want to have face uh, coverings, that that is a good thing and a preferable thing in addition to the physical distancing and the stay at home order. And we put out guidelines of what that looks like. The concern that we have about mandating it is referenced in my comments just a moment ago. Uh, we are still trying to protect our healthcare workers, provide them the appropriate uh, N95 masks and surgical masks and gowns and coveralls. The testing uh, capacity in the state is also impacted by uh, masks and personal protective gear. And as a consequence, we want to make sure that that's prioritized in the state of California. Uh, but we have been very clear 
uh, that if you are going into an environment where physical distancing is all but impossible, for example, into a grocery store uh, with small aisles and a long queue, uh, that we do believe uh, it would be additive and beneficial uh, to have a face covering. Sophia Balog, SACB. Hi, Governor. Um I want to ask about uh, some reports related to churches and other religious organizations that are staying open despite the stay-at-home orders. Um, earlier today, the Bee reported on a church in Rancho Cordova um, that's continuing apparently to meet. I'm wondering, do you is your office looking into that church or any other churches that are um, you know reported to be staying open? And do you have any message for religious leaders? who are arguing that um, the services that they provide are essential. Well, with all due respect, it's essential that we practice physical distancing everywhere, period, full stop. And so I would highly encourage anyone that is not practicing physical distancing to reconsider it. And to the extent they refuse, uh, we will apply social pressure. Uh, and to the extent possible, we will advance additional enforcement. Specific to your question about this specific site, uh, I am not aware of any ongoing enforcement. As you know, the protocols for enforcement are bottom up, not top down. Uh, and so we would look to local leaders uh, to enforce those policies first, and to the extent they need support from the state of California, we would avail ourselves to supporting additional enforcement. Angela Hart, Kaiser Health News. Hey, Governor, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, we're getting some reports about um, uh, home uh, tents being uh, used uh, by the state, by the administration at um, California State Hospitals. And I wanted to ask if that is happening, um, if so, to what degree? And is that part of your broader effort um, in, of, uh, of caring for um, COVID-positive homeless people, as well as perhaps uh, homeless people who don't have um, the virus? So tomorrow, we're going to make some very specific announcements and update uh, everybody on our efforts around homeless uh, and the current status of our trailers that we announced a number of weeks ago and the number of hotel rooms we're procuring, how we're prioritizing. We're going to lay out in detail uh, our regional strategies, our regional partners, county by county, uh, and then we'll be able to provide you clarity in terms of your question. Uh, again, this time tomorrow, uh, we will specifically be laying those things out. Laurel Rosenhall, Cal Matters. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I was wondering generally how you are preparing for the state budget that's upcoming, the May revise, and specifically whether you intend to continue advancing the idea of providing health insurance to undocumented Californians who are over age 65, as you had proposed in January? Well, we have a workload budget, which suggests everything's on the table. The January budget is no longer operable uh, in terms of the conversations I'm having with staff and conversations I'm having with legislative leaders. They recognize the enormity of this moment. 1.9 million unemployment insurance claims just since March 12th. The world has radically changed since the January budget was proposed. So everything is on the table. That's an honest and sober uh, reflection of that reality. Uh, we certainly are being benefited uh, modestly by the federal stimulus in terms of the state block grants. Cities and counties, though, uh, will continue to struggle uh, and suffer. And that's Carla's question, and now it's come back to me on the issue of property tax, which they disproportionately rely on uh, and is the one source of funding that does not come to the state of California, local property taxes, CSAC, the county association. Uh, we had a call, uh, and they have requested uh, that we not impose upon them any mandate or dictate from on high unless we are prepared to backfill uh, the impacts of that mandate. And so... Carla, that's the answer to that question, but it's part and parcel of a totality of considerations, including the announcements I made today on deferral for one year of up to $50,000 in sales taxes. That's money that people need in counties and cities and at the state level. Uh, the magnitude of the impact of all of this is just coming into, uh, I think, full light of day, and I think we should be prepared uh, for substantial adjustments in our budget. 
Kathleen Renane, AP. Hi, Governor. I want to talk about testing. So um, it's my understanding that California has a testing uh, backlog of somewhere around 59 or 60,000 tests that we just haven't yet processed. Um, and yesterday, LA's county health director was saying that some people are waiting up to 12 days for the results. So what are some of the specific things that we're doing to reduce this backlog as we ramp up testing? You know, are we adding capacity um, to analyze tests? How are we making sure that this backlog doesn't just grow as we ramp up testing? And further, has the state sent guidelines to counties about what data they should be collecting and sharing with the public when it comes to testing? Well, very, very specific guidelines have been sent out to the counties some time ago, not just the counties. Uh, I'll remind you there's really four buckets of testing in the state of California. You have academic institutions that are testing. Uh, you have the state uh, labs that are testing. Uh, you have the commercial labs that are testing. And then you have all of these private sector uh, point of care labs that are popping up everywhere. And so we have sent out uh, detailed uh, requests that not only we get the number of positives once those diagnostic uh, results come back, but the number of negatives. Uh, we had protocols in the past uh, where the commercial labs and others were only providing certain information, not the totality of the information. And that's why, as you know well, a few weeks ago, we've been very transparent about this. Uh, we said those numbers would change, and they did. Uh, you're correct. It's 59,500 test results are still pending. This is a national problem. Uh, just one lab in the United States has over 100 plus thousand uh, backlogged tests. Uh, those large commercial labs are overwhelmed uh, by the demand. And you know, you talk about LabCorp and Quest, this is what they do 24 seven. Even this moment is overwhelming for them. Uh, here's the good news. Every day we're increasing the number of tests that are being conducted. But we do recognize the time to delay. Yesterday, I mentioned it up to 12 days. So I've heard that the day before. We had heard up to eight to 10 days. Uh, the backlogs are not necessarily getting better in real time. But we're hopeful uh, as these protocols and procedures and the new serology tests, those are the blood-based tests uh, that look uh, for proteins related to your immune system and antibodies, begin to supplement just the PCR tests, which are the dominant tests that have current backlog uh, that will be able to substantially fast track those test results. Let me add to that as specific. You know, because I think we've all written about it, uh, Abbott announced their testing capacity, five to 15 minutes to get back results. Those are point of care tests. Uh, but I want to caution people. The state of California uh, received only 100 uh, cassettes, uh, 15 different lab sets. Uh, do the math. I mean, it's, it's an irrelevant, or rather, no, it's relevant to the individual. It's an insignificant total amount of tests uh, that we can produce in five to 15 minutes. Uh, in the state of California. So before people rush to, well, what about this I read about or what about that? It's all about scale, and the scale is impacted not just by the time for diagnostics, but it's also impacted by the ability to get the samples. That's swabs. That's the media. Uh, and still, it's about reagents, the RNA extraction. That's the PCR test that finds the RNA virus in the nasal cavity. And you need the extraction kit, which is part of the reagents. Uh, those continue, those supplies also continue to be uh, scarce for many. So uh, I could, that could sound very confusing, but I hope it gives you a sense of the totality of what we are looking to uh, organize more deliberately around in terms of our testing regimes. And know we have a new task force on tests. Uh, and in the next couple of days, uh, we're going to provide some, I think, very good news about our capacity to substantially increase our tests in the state of California. There's a reason I spoke about serology, uh, blood-based tests, and the PCR tests in these labs and academia. Uh, we have uh, a remarkable collection of individuals now advising us to get to the next level, which we think uh, potentially could be best in class from even an international perspective, not just a national perspective in terms of improving uh, the time to diagnostics and the ability to get more samples and to provide the appropriate level of supplies, including PPE. Ashley Zawala, Cron 4. Hey, Governor. I just, I'm curious about any possible travel restrictions that California might put in place, just given that, you know, you said that we're buying time here and 
just looking at, you know, some constant travel from the East Coast and here, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, look, if someone travels for essential reasons into the state of California, um, they have to practice. You come into the state of California, you have to practice physical distancing. We have a stay-at-home order if you're non-essential. So anybody that comes into the state is subject to those same rules and same regulations. So that's where we are currently. Uh, we haven't thought beyond that. As long as our strong stay-at-home orders are enforced and into effect and the physical distancing um, uh, is constant, if you're a visitor in the state or your residents in the state, uh, you are required and appropriate uh, for each of us to uh, recognize that we all have a responsibility once in this state to be, uh, well, to have the application of those rules equally applied to everybody. Emily Dooley, Bloomberg Law. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking these questions. Um, some safe water advocates have asked for a moratorium on water shutoff during this. Can you comment a little bit on that? Uh, not only can I comment, um, we appreciate their leadership, their advocacy. I was very proud to work with the legislature this year on a safe drinking water strategy that struggled for a few years in the state. Uh, very controversial. Uh, we were very proud that we were able to meet that moment last year, and those same advocates have made it crystal clear, not just to you, to me, that they want to protect not just residents from having their water shut off, uh, but also small businesses. I signed an executive order today to do just that. Aldo Toledo, Mercury News. Hi, Governor. Thank you so much for taking my question. I'm wondering if uh, yesterday uh, during your school's update, uh, whether it was you and uh, Tony Thurman's intention to close all schools, despite not being able to order to do so yes. as a state unilaterally. Look, uh, kids uh, are not going to go back to their classrooms. Um, they, however, are going to have a lot of work to do at home and we'll continue to educate our kids through distance learning. I, I can't be more clear about this. Superintendent can't be more clear about this. Uh, the, the, the modeling we provided yesterday, uh, I think, provides more clarity in terms of where we expect to be in a number of weeks, another month. Uh, I think the worst decision we could make uh, is, I've said this in the past, is, you know, is uh, cutting our parachute when we're way above the ground. And I don't think there'd be anything more impactful that would example uh, or manifest that metaphor than sending six plus million children back into our public schools as vectors to come back home with their grandpa and grandma and family members and potentially when we're so close to turning the page and getting into the summer months and getting in a different phase of this virus to see it flare back up. So the superintendent's been clear, our president of our state school board has been clear, I've been as clear as I possibly can, and I hope that uh, the school districts start to approach the distance learning application, or the school-based meal application, uh, and really get to work on making sure our kids are working at home despite the deep anxiety and stress that places uh, on our parents, particularly our mothers uh, and those teachers that I met with yesterday on a Zoom call uh, that are not only educating their kids through distance learning, uh, but also uh, having to take care of their own at home. And so deep respect and empathy once again uh, and admiration for those that are bearing an even greater burden uh, to meet this moment with the call for those schools to shut down. Dustin Gardner, SF Chronicle. Hi, Governor. Um, we've heard stories about nurses um, having to cut up trash bags to use as protective equipment um, and taking other kind of extreme measures because they don't have equipment. You've mentioned the state has made a deal to obtain more than 100 million N95 masks. I'm wondering, can you tell us anything about how soon nurses and healthcare workers might expect to receive those supplies and how long the state expects they might last? So every day I'm updating you. Today I updated you with a number 35.9 million 
and 95 masks we've distributed. That number has changed substantially from even a week ago because in real time we're answering that question even though it's not posed. As soon as we get a shipment in, even if it's 10,000, 100,000, a million, we do our best to get it out as quickly as possible. I use the N95s as a proxy. Again, we can go through that list of shields and coveralls and gowns and glove sets, all of them equally important uh, for many. Uh, I recognize the deep anxiety for people all across this state that are doing do-it-themselves strategies and makeshift strategies, and we're doing everything in our power, uh, our Herculean effort uh, to do more and do better for them. Uh, so we have folks all around the world. We've got shipments coming in in partnership with FEMA, Department of Defense, that come in on a daily basis. I talked about the 179 or 176,000 masks coming in in our fourth shipment from the national stockpile, just the N95s. I'm working uh, almost 24-7. It's not a gross exaggeration as a conduit uh, to these uh, logistics. And I will just say, as an example, uh, not all of it goes well. It shouldn't surprise you. I'll give you an example. We had a shipment that came in Texas, uh, and it was sent back. Why? Because all the masks were moldy. Uh, that's something that's going to happen when you're shipping things from around the world and you're trying to get folks uh, uh, to move quickly. Uh, others have been turned back at the border in Mexico, so we work through this. We anticipate this. It's a huge logistics operation. And in addition to that, we're working domestically with partners within the state of California to begin to repurpose their facilities. Uh, I mentioned the partnerships, including the private sector, not just Apple uh, that procured masks for us, not just the work that's being done on ventilators from companies uh, like Space. SpaceX or the work being done uh, by Virgin Orbit, but 7-Eleven uh, that provided it their Stockton warehouse uh, masks for the state. So as soon as they come in, we get them out. They can't come in soon enough. Katie Orr, KQED. Um, hi, Governor. I just wanted to follow up on the property tax deadline. So it seems like you're saying the counties have asked you not to extend the April 10th deadline unless the state can make up for what's lost. What do you say to homeowners who can't afford to make that payment right now? Well, we're working to try to look. The assessors and the counties make that determination. This is not the state's money, unlike a lot of other taxes that are collected. We've made great progress on the residential side. We're trying to make even more progress on the commercial side, and that's a preview to conversations we're having with some of our nation's largest banks as well, similar to the residential mortgage and the forbearance deal uh, that we just announced. Uh, we are assessing our options as it relates to property tax, and I deeply recognize that anxiety uh, as someone like you and others, perhaps, that pay those property taxes to see what we can do. We're working with the counties. Uh, they're very anxious. Uh, as I said, in this space, and we're seeing uh, if there's ways to soften this. Uh, so this is a conversation in real time. Uh, but again, the purpose uh, of full transparency, uh, they were very clear, the assessors and the county uh, uh, officers, about their hope and expectation. Uh, but I am carrying that weight as governor of the state of California uh, to answer uh, the question to you and the millions of homeowners in the state uh, that are feeling that anxiety coming up on April 10th. And, uh, and we're going to see what our options are and see what we can do uh, to, to help in this moment. But I don't want to overpromise in this space. Taryn Luna, LA Times. Governor, you've talked about the need for community surveillance testing, and we'd like more details on that. Where has community surveillance testing been done so far? How many people have been tested, and what are the results? Yeah, so we'll put that out. I told you we've got this new workforce. I talked at length about the PCR versus serology uh, and our new efforts there. Uh, we'll be announcing, so you'll have exactly what you're looking for, uh, an update of all of the tests that have been done, where they're getting done, who's doing them, uh, what the specimen collection challenges are, what the RNA extraction and reagent challenges are. Uh, we're going to put all of that out. You'll be very, I think, satisfied uh, with those details. Uh, there are dozens and dozens, excuse me, hundreds and hundreds, excuse me, thousands and thousands of points. Uh, and we want to make sure when that information is provided, it is as accurate as you would expect and demand of me, and I expect and demand uh, of my Director of Health and Human Services uh, that is leading that effort. Karma Dickerson, Fox 40. Hi, Governor. Thank you for talking about the uh, unemployment claim, specifically what EDG is doing to try to increase capacity. But this 
question goes to more along the lines of the Federal CARES Act, the unemployment expansion there, people who would not have typically been covered under unemployment, for example, wanting an extra 13 weeks of benefits or the self-employed. They currently have no option on applying at this point. EDD says they have not gotten the guidance from the federal government. And so there are people who have been told you're newly covered but have no option of applying. And for example, someone like a hairdresser, depending on when her stay-at-home orders came down, hasn't had a paycheck in nearly a month, and based on processing times would be, you know, at least another month. Yeah. Is there anything that can be done to get some clarity between the federal and uh, state EDD offices? Well, this is where I'm very pleased to say that I have Julie Sue on the line. And Julie is our labor secretary uh, and is asking and answering exactly this question among many, many others uh, on a daily basis, an hourly basis. And let me ask Julie, uh, to opine and give you some more specifics uh, about those circumstances, which we are very familiar with. Julie? Thank you, Governor. Of course. So the Federal CARES Act has a number of different components. And just to be really clear, some of them do apply to traditional unemployment insurance, right? There's the $600 a week for up to four months that uh, people who are applying for unemployment insurance will be eligible for, and we have been gearing up and are ready to get those payments out as early as next week, barring any last-minute requirements that the Federal D Department of Labor puts into place. But you're asking about the pandemic unemployment assistance, which is for individuals who are not eligible for unemployment insurance. These include the self-employed, um, true independent contractors, and we have been working with the Department of Labor to get more guidance in the meantime, we are putting up some information about it. So if you go to, uh, you can go to the labor agency, the labor.ca.gov COVID-19 information to find out more about that. But we are working diligently to both get the information we need from the federal government and to stand up some information um, here to make sure that, uh, that, that, that as soon as the federal money is available, that we are able to get it out. Thanks, Julie. And, and I want to acknowledge uh, Julie's incredible leadership. She's been hosting webinars in this space. Uh, we worked in our partnership. I want to just thank Univision for their efforts to uh, make sure that we are truly culturally competent in terms of the outreach in the state of California in this space. Uh, she has over 1,200 advisors, 80 different locations throughout the state of California that are trying to triage and answer those questions uh, quite literally in real time. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do. The magnitude of this is, again, without precedent. Uh, good enough never is. And we recognize the deep responsibility and the burden that it is on us, Julie, and her incredible team over there uh, to be able to answer those questions to help people uh, that are a point of deep anxiety and crisis. Another question? Jim Roop, Westwood One News. Hi, uh, thank you, Governor, very much. And please thank the first partner, too. That's one understanding spouse you have there, I'll tell you. Uh, you. Interested to know, because based on the president's comments and, and comments from other governors around the country, April seems to be a make or break month uh, in many respects. You laid a bunch of stuff out yesterday uh, with Dr. Galley in, in the charts of what could happen if we, if we really try to flatten that curve. So could you tell me, in, in your words, what do you think the next two or three weeks looks like in the state of California? Look, I, I, I've mentioned this in the past. I'll repeat it. The number I wake up to every single day is the number of hospitalized that are COVID-19 positive and the number of people in the ICU. Again, those numbers, 1,922 COVID positive that have been hospitalized and 816 uh, that are in the ICU. We look at our capacity within the system to surge, and we look at our capacity to meet this from a human resource perspective and with the appropriate level of protective gear. That's the line that we are modeling. Uh, I was encouraged this morning. Uh, it's devastating for the individuals, but in terms of that trend line to see just a 5.4% increase in those ICU numbers, remember a week or so ago, we saw almost a doubling overnight. Uh, that created obviously pause and some concern. So day to day, uh, it matters, but we like to see trends. And so the trend that we 
laid out yesterday was a projected trend if we continue through the appropriate physical distancing and the incredible work that 40 million Californians have done to help bend this curve and meet this moment, uh, that if we can continue uh, with that curve at a more modest slope, that will buy us more time to prepare. And that gives us a few weeks to prepare uh, for an upcoming peak that could come into the middle of May. That's a very different expectation than other parts of the country, but that's our basis of our current modeling, which, as I continue to remind people, is subject to change any given day. Final question, Alex Michelson, Fox 11. Uh, thank you, Governor. A question on the issue of education. Um, we're a few weeks into this distance learning experiment, and I know you like uh, to talk about statistics and learn about things. So yeah. what do you think is working right now in terms of distance learning? What's not working? What's your advice to parents on that issue? And for yourself on a personal level, how do you talk about that issue with your own kids? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, uh, it is, uh, there is a, a, a big distance between a parent teaching their child and a teacher teaching their child. Uh, it's not that our kids don't respect their parents. They just don't seem to respect them when it comes to educating them as much as they do their teachers. So if there was ever any doubt about how extraordinarily valuable in society our teachers are, I hope we've disabused anyone of that doubt. Uh, this is an incredible burden that's placed on households. Uh, we were talking uh, to four teachers yesterday, uh, and they're doing their best on distance learning. They were offering best practice advice from Oakland to San Diego uh, and San Jose and Los Angeles about their struggles, even, and I bring those examples up, even in parts of the state that socioeconomically have incredible capacity to provide for internet access and how they're struggling even within those communities to get download speeds that are appropriate to the curriculum and appropriate to the needs and how so many of their own kids don't even have access to what you and I take for granted and that's a smartphone or a tablet, a Chromebook and the like. So what I'm learning is this is not just a rural issue and an urban issue. The reality is all across the state People are struggling, and we put out very comprehensive guidelines. I, again, mentioned yesterday I was very proud that they're being shared across the country, uh, but we have enormous amount of work to do, and that's why the announcement yesterday was so important, to remind people to anchor in their consciousness that schools are closed but classes are in, and we've got to double down on our distance learning work. And I was very proud that Google stepped up 100,000 hotspots that they've donated to the state of California, three months of free unlimited data and downloads that they're providing so we can address some of those vulnerabilities throughout the state and also providing thousands of Chromebooks. I said this in my remarks yesterday, we need more Googles. And so if you're a company that provides hotspots, if you're a company that wants to contribute more in terms of uh, those books and the tablets, please, this is the moment to do so. And it's also, forgive me the long-windedness, it's a reminder that the equity issue is magnified in a crisis in profound and deep ways. And reminds me of where we were even before this crisis, which was unacceptable, the digital divide and the disparities that exist uh, in this state and in this nation, we must confront them head on. And this is just a prime example uh, of that. And, and so if there's anything good that comes out of it, it's gonna be protocols and procedures uh, that not only are seared in our mind and memory, but in our frame of reference moving forward and in our resolve uh, to address those issues much more uh, proactively. Any other questions? Renee Santos. Renee. KBR. Governor, question specifically in regards to beds. When should we be seeing the beds arrive in Sleep Train Arena? Are beds going anywhere else in the Sacramento region? And who will staff it? Yeah, so the Sleep Train, we just signed the contract. Army Corps of Engineers has been working to spec out 
what needs to get done there. We now have a contractor on the site and we're working uh, with California-based labor. Uh, these things, trust me, matter and it's been part of a logistics effort uh, that uh, people are working overtime to secure. Uh, the total number of beds plus or minus currently is 393 plus or minus, but that gives you a sense of the range. In the next 10 to 14 days, you're going to see a lot of progress in that specific site, but it's part of the total surge package. That's just one example. We have also spec'd out, they've looked the Army Corps of over 24 sites in the state of California uh, from the Oakland Colory, uh, Coliseum, uh, not just uh, Sleep Train Arena. We have motel and hotel rooms that are be available, not just for homeless, but also hospital surge. Uh, and we are working very collaboratively uh, with Mayor Steinberg in terms of localizing to your question around Sacramento and the county. Uh, their surge capacity and planning needs as well. So thousands of units are up and running. All those FMS sites have been identified, the 2,000 beds that come from the federal uh, cash. Uh, we have uh, half of them already uh, that have been set up. Uh, and as it relates to staffing, in each and every county, staffing works differently. Some counties will absorb all the staffing needs. Other counties do partnerships with the state 50-50. And so specific to sleep train, uh, that is a work in progress. And I'll let you know uh, when we work out those protocols. Let me just end by uh, making one additional point. Um, you know, we never say this enough, and that is thank you to law enforcement. Thank you to police officers, sheriffs. Uh, we lost our first a police officer, young woman, 44 years young, a detective in Santa Rosa, 20-year veteran uh, of law enforcement, uh, lost her life uh, because of this virus. And so I just want to express um, our empathy, not only to her and our family, uh, the impact uh, this has had on the Santa Rosa uh, police uh, community, but more broadly to law enforcement across the state. And let me just thank law enforcement for meeting this moment as well. And thank you for putting on a badge every damn morning to keep people safe. And it's a reminder of how vulnerable law enforcement is as well. Take care, everybody.